Right, welcome everybody for the uh, third session of the day up here. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dean, Dean Stansel, who has been Animal Aid's horse racing consultant for 16 years now, um, and is the sort of the brains and the researcher behind uh, that horse horse race death watch campaign. Um, it's a campaign against horse racing. Also, Fee actually is the main campaigner in the office. Uh, um, He's, uh, t today, he's not talking about horse racing, um, he's talking about the historical use of horses as beasts of burden. Um, and Animal Aid has a specific campaign within that on um, horse drawn tourist carriages, uh, which is uh, a lot of councils are trying to bring back and uh, well, say we'd like to nip it in the bud. I think perhaps we haven't quite managed to nip it in the bud, but uh, a couple of times. Yeah. Still a long, long campaign. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, Dave? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, this pres presentation is going to contain some graphic images of horses suffering, so if you bear that in mind, you might want to look away or, or even go out if you don't upset you too much. Um, that's a bit further down the line from the start of this presentation. But, uh, it's going to be talking about the use of horses as, as utilities uh, from historic times right through to the present day. Um, horses have been used for their strength and mobility uh, and have been exploited for that for thousands and thousands of years. But to begin with, first of all, I'd like to show you this piece of equipment. Does anybody know what it is? Just out of interest. Yeah, horses, but it's, yeah. Uh, and the modern carriage horse has one of these stuck in his mouth, or her mouth, when they work. Uh, this is a, a Liverpool bit. I'm going to pass it round so everybody can get a feel and look at this close up. And what happens with the horse when you put this on? You stick this bar in the mouth of the horse, this chain goes underneath, and these are the cheek pieces at the side. And it's used as a method of, to control the horse particularly for carriage horses. Uh, it turns them right and left, it stops and starts them. It bangs around in the mouth for six or seven hours or whatever, however long they're working. Not only that, when the horse has got this in his mouth, they can't do a lot. They can't resist this. They can't, they can't fight this. This really does control them. But it's also got to remember that they're pulling maybe half a ton behind them. So, Six, seven hours work with half a ton of this in your mouth, you're very, very submissive. So I'm going to pass it right to left and we'll pass it round. Hopefully, I've got it still got it at the end of the time. Uh, there we go, you can feel that. And imagine that in your mouth for a period of time. And it holds the tongue there. And we can all stick our tongues in our mouth and move our tongues without the and touch the roof of our mouths with our tongues. The horses with that bar in the middle, it locks the tongue in place. There for six or seven hours or however long they're working and they can't move the tongue. It sits between two sets of teeth, front teeth and back teeth, and between those there's a, a gummy bit, just straight gums, and it sits, should sit on the gums. Um, but it does work and bang against the teeth. And a lot of horses, when you look in the mouths, carriage horses, cart horses, will see chipped teeth around that area. It's a very, very painful. Uh, so this, this first slide, um, this is taken from the times of the Assyrians, 750 BC or 750 BC, as it used to be called. Uh, it shows a, a chariot. Chariots weren't just used for, for fighting, they were also used to transport goods. Uh, and before people actually rode horses, they used chariots. Chariots were used about a thousand years before people actually sat on top of horses and rode them. And horses were much smaller in those days than they are now. So if you've ever seen Ben Hur or films like that, they are far removed from the reality, both in the bridling um, and also uh, the size and scope of the horses. Um, what we can see here is a yoking method to control the horses. Yokes have been used, for, as I say, for thousands of years. Primarily, they were first be used on oxen to for ploughing, as you'll probably be aware, and also to pull cars. But when horses were first domesticated and used to pull 
um, carts and, and chariots, they were yoked, which is a very, very primitive form of harnessing the horse. You can see this is the yoke area, this area here, and it's, it sits on the back of the neck. Um, not very comfortable for horses, it's better for oxen, but not very good for horses. It's not good for oxen either, but there sits on the back of the neck, so there's another one in the pulling area. Uh, so that's problematic, and you can see that this, there's actually two horses here, you can't really make it out too well. If you look at the legs, you can see there are eight legs in this, there's two horses. Uh, and we've got a, a, a throat attachment you know, which holds the yoke in place. If the horse is pulled too hard, that would obviously press on the trachea the windpipe and choke the horses if they pulled too hard. So it's probably a, a restraining method as well. And we can see the use of the whip as well to drive the horses forward. This is the whip. Um, and when it was a famous battle about 500 years before this in um, 1294 BC, in BC uh, between the uh, Hittites and the Egyptians. And there was about 6,000 chariots took part, that's about 12,000 horses were used. And they drove them into battle, the two opposing armies were driven into battle against each other. And the idea was to smash the other, you know, to smash these horses into the, into the opposing infantry or the opposing cavalry, and the opposing uh, uh, chariots. Uh, and what you would do if you were on the opposing side, you would kill the horses before you killed the people. So 12,000 horses, probably at the Battle of Kadesh in that year, uh, probably half the horses were killed. Uh, probably more horses killed than actually these them. And that's it, between the Egyptians, which were part of Egypt, still part of Egypt, and the Hittites, which were, uh, 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 their area was in the present day Turkey, and the Assyrians there in the, the Syrian Iraqi area that uh, is the current uh, boundaries today. Uh, so we see the horses shackled by the, by the yoke, um, uh, and this persisted for, for, for about another thousand, thousand and a half years. Uh, oh, there we go. So just to explain this a bit, oh come on, I'll just go back, there we go. I'll do this crude drawing here, uh, but I just want to explain the difference in the harnessing without getting too train spotted. But the yoke, you can see the, the chariot and the horse, when the horse is yoked from the withers to the bottom of the neck there, and the trace is, is the link, the, the pulling uh, rope to the, to the chariot, when it's at a greater degree, it makes it harder for the horses to pull. And if you lower that trace to a lower area on the horse, which is the chest or breast kind of area, um, it, it makes it a little bit easier for the horses to pull. Still demanding, it. but if you could get a, a trace or a, 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 a connection on a parallel, <coughs> It, it, it uses the full power of the horse. The more you use the trace at a higher angle, the less power you get from the, the horse. So in those primitive days of, of the chariots, it was very, very difficult for horses to pull big weights. And in the Roman times, um, uh, there was a, what they called a Theodosian code, a lot of rules made by the Roman emperors just after uh, about 300-400 AD. Uh, AD. And they said that the maximum amount that horses could pull was about half a ton, 500 kilograms. Uh, that wasn't particularly an animal welfare issue. It would be nice to think that it was, but it, it wasn't the first sort of animal welfare law. Unfortunately, it was really about not churning up the roads, the very primitive roads there was in those days, because the roads were very poor, and the greater weight went on the back, the more they the ruined the road. The, the, the roads at that time. So, very quickly now, three types of harnesses used. Very, I mean, there's, there's various um, differences on these, but, but the basics are three types of harnesses. The, the old yoke, the chest or breast collar, and the full collar. The yoke, as I say, is a very poor pulling method for the horse, takes great strain on the horse. The breast collar fits around the chest area. Uh, Used nowadays for light carriage horses, uh, not that efficient, but it takes a greater area of the horse's body. So the greater area that, that there is, the more pulling power the horses can use. And then there's the full collar, uh, which is used uh, to have some pulling heavier loads. And that goes round the, fully round the, the shoulder area, 
chest as well, as well as the withers, so they've got a greater pulmonary, pulmonary easier on the horses. Uh, but still, you know, obviously from that point of view, not great. It, it just improves the draft capability of the horse, the, the bigger the car. So a medieval ladder wagon. From about the 11th century, uh, full collar started to come into use. You can see the full collar there, around the horse, and the traces. Uh, probably the way this is drawn isn't that great, and it probably weren't as steep as that. Uh, and we can see another chap sat on the horse there, whipping the horse's form. Um, this is from the end of the 1300s. Um, the yokes were phased out. Uh, and gradually the breast collar and, uh, and full collar will be beginning to be used. Uh, I'll move on to the next one. We think of, 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 of using horses and carts. We see, see a lot of historical documentation on the TV uh, about moving goods. And a lot of it is quite utterly misrepresented, misrepresented. Because the main method of moving goods over any any distance of beyond about six miles outside of the town would be used by pack horses, not particularly carts. So the dominant way to move goods from city to city, town to town, village to village, would be on a pack horse and not a cart. So <coughs> horses were used in this way for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it wasn't until we got the toll roads in the 17th and 18th century when roads improved that we started to see more carriages throughout Europe, throughout Britain being used, because this was the key method of moving goods on a horse's back. Uh, and these are, these are coal trains, pack horses in huge trains. These are the Welsh valleys where coal was mined. We all know about horses down in mines and the way that they suffered in mines, but we're probably not aware as much about the horses who actually took the coal from the mines to its destination. Most of those destinations were to rivers, canals, and seaports, because the cost of moving coal in this method doubled every 10 miles. So to keep the cost of coal down, you would move it to the nearest water course. And these coal trains were probably uh, 50, 100 horses or Welsh ponies long. Uh, and each horse carried what we call a bushel of coal, a bushel of weight. And a bushel can be any particular amount depending on what material you carry. Bushel of coal weighs about 14 stone, 90 kilograms. We've got about 14 stone now, it's back over here, up to that 90 kilograms. Uh, and they would transport them uh, day in, day out, barely out day out. Uh, around that time, um, hold on, I'm just getting the right slides. Yeah, around that time, in the 1690s, at the other end of the country, in Newcastle, there were 20,000 horses of these, 20,000 horses like this, moving the coal from Newcastle to other areas. 20,000 horses in the 1690s. Um, so that's a coal train. And then we moved on to wagon mills, uh, wooden rails to move coal, uh, particularly where the ground was, was on the level. Uh, I think this, this is from 1765. It's probably not to scale, but at least I hope it isn't. Because that horse has got a hand of a chop on there. He has, but he's it's, it's got a full cool colour harness on, you can see. And the rails made it a lot easier. Um, uh, and it, it, this, this was a method that they used and, and, and it improved upon over time. Eventually, the wooden rails were replaced by iron and so on and so forth. But, uh, to just bring that up to date a little bit, so the first distressing picture is this one. This is in the, found this one 1926 in the USA. And you can see the, the wagon way here, and the horse waiting there to move, and this poor horse has for some reason collapsed uh, and been trying to be handled. And then as, as time went on, horse breeding, in, in, well, you wouldn't say improved, but People wanted to get bigger, stronger horses, so they, they bred them and we got bigger and bigger horses to pull bigger and bigger loads because we had the Industrial Revolution taking place. Goods were more, uh, you know, been producing greater quantities, bigger amounts, so we had to keep, or, or, or the people at that time, had to keep those moving in 
and so they bred bigger horses. <coughs> this is a group these four horses moving 13 tons now. We probably know about horses in agriculture. Uh, we know about the Shires and the Clydesdales and the Suffolk Punches are probably breeds you may be aware of. And I found this picture and I looked at it and I thought it's quite interesting this picture. Because uh, what do we actually see here? Um, these look like Clydesdale horses because Shires tend to work flat around. Um, we can see this horse here shackled to the wagon behind with a heavy load. And he's obviously come uphill. Uh, and what they did, it, it, right up to sort of the 1930s and 40s after the Second World War, they used horses to transport goods in agriculture. Uh, and here you would see it at seasonal time, at harvest time, you would get guys who would hire out to the farmer, say an extra price there, to get that amount uphill. Because one horse couldn't get a full load up the hill because it was far too heavy. So guys would all have a price there or whatever, and they would hire them out to the, to the farmer uh, for a few pence, and he would help that horse up the hill. Likewise, going downhill, you would have the horse at the front, and we would shackle this horse to the back of the cart, so that the cart didn't run away with the horse in front. So horses were used for various things, not only to, to do that, but also to plow, uh, until the sort of tractors took over their burden. Now, transporting people in carriages, this is a picture from around about 1600s. Um, first hire coaches appeared in London in 1625. And then we move on, and throughout that century, by the end of the century, 1680, there was a thousand carriages working the streets of London. That's a heck of a lot of carriages. And they, the, horses, the horses were housed at inns at various areas around London. So 1680, a thousand carriages working. But of course, at that time, still quite expensive to take a carriage. So most people, wherever they wanted to go, would actually walk to their destination. We wouldn't use a carriage, most people still walked. Uh, this is a Victorian, getting nearer to today, this is a Victorian carriage, Hackney carriage, it's a cab stand. Um, found this car in 1860. Uh, very sorry looking horse, I wouldn't really call it a cartoon as such, but very sorry looking horse there, worn through, and we got the cab driver and uh, a guy from the Bartram and she can get his right thought. And at all the cab stands, there were 600 cab stands in London around that time. And you could have 11 cab stands, a bit like a bus station, 11 cabs you could have lined up. So that's about 6,600 cabs could be lined up at any one time for business. And of course, there'd be other cabs out there on the street working at the same time. And interestingly, every, every cab stand would have its cab stand dogs, wild dogs that didn't have homes, they would live around the cab stands waiting for tidbits from the, maybe the driver or if the horses were fed or water, <coughs> they would drink the water or a bit of feed there and when it's cold they would sit under the horse to keep warm and when it was wet the dogs would sit under the, the carriages to keep dry. So that's how dogs got through Victorian times if they had no homes. The cab stands was a vital, vital area for those stray dogs. But very sad for the horses. So, how far removed from reality is this cartoon, this picture of this horse? Uh, if we look at this close, closely, we can see this old horse. He's, he's having his feet, he's got his nose back on. Not a great way to feed a horse, actually. Very bad way to feed a horse, but still. First sight, I may not notice too much. But when we start to look at horses, the wear and tear on them, we look at the legs. Very, very bad legs. This lad's still, or lass has done a lot, a lot of work to get legs like that. You've got the two long bones in the leg, you've got the radius there, and the, uh, 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 the tendon bones here, down to the pastors. And that's where all the problems is. In this area, this is called the knee of the horse. It's actually the wrist, but we call it the knee. Uh, and this horse would have fallen down quite and stumbled quite a number of times to get bad knees like that. And in this area of the carpal bones, which 
between two long bones. That's seven little bones in there. And when you go down on those, they break. Uh, the, cartridge, the cartilage decays. The verses that hold the fluid all, all, all break. So we get fluid build up in there. Probably all those seven, seven bones in the knee are absolutely shattered. And very, very painful for this house. And then, we, then we look down at the fetlocks. This area here. Um, just all the past and bones. And they look like open sores, open abscesses. So very, very painful. You can see the, you can, when I to get this bad, actually see the bones right through in there. So very, very painful. And you just don't clear up. You can't, you wouldn't be able to treat that. So that horse would, would be working in that condition in absolute agony. So the idea that we see on these romantic sort of uh, modern TV um, dramas of these horses in carriages and pulling carriages is far removed from the truth. Thanks. Has everybody seen this, this bit? Has everybody seen this? Yeah, I think we're also too late to come up with So, I'll just give you a bit more detail about, about the, the, the higher hackney carriages and cabs. There was two types predominantly, from the Victorian times right through to the early 20th century. We've got the Hanson cab, which you probably know the name of, the Clarence carriage. Uh, this used to be called the ground, this carriage, because of the noise that it made on the roads. It's quite a heavy carriage, you can see all the cobble streets, and you would say, oh, I'm going to hire a ground because of the noise that it made. This was a, a four-wheel vehicle, a sit four people. This was a two-wheel vehicle, sit two people, driver at the back and driver at the front on this. And we can see this horse getting a bit ribby now, plenty of work on in there that he's been doing. Um, they've come over from Ireland about the age of four years old, and they cost around £30 to, 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 for the company or the driver to buy the horse, about £30. Quid. Um, at the age of four, they'd have about two months training and then they were out on the streets working. And they start off as very pristine, very healthy horses, as we can see. This horse doesn't look in too bad, mate. Uh, but in a few years, it's certainly been looking very different. They work 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, Monday till Saturday, and they just have Sunday off. And they do about 40 miles a day, and you could pull up to half a ton, particularly in something like, like this Clarence car. Um, so, quite demanding, you just get the one day off a week, and then you would be in your stable. So you wouldn't be in a green field, you'd either be between those shafts or in a stable. Some horses were individually owned by, by people, others were owned by big corporate, big companies. Um, so a company could have a thousand of these horses, a thousand carriages, and what they would do, they would hire the driver for the day, or for you know, make it a contract for the whole week. So the driver would go along with his two quid. To me, he was meant to be licensed, though a lot of them weren't. Uh, he would go along to the hire company, he would pay his two pound to the company, and he would take the horse and carry it out, and then try and get as many fares as he could to cover his two quid, and then get a profit on the top. So he would work the horse as much as he could in a 12 hour day. Uh, interestingly, uh, doing a bit of research, found that 2,000 cab, in the 1880s, one year in the 1880s, 2,000 cab drivers, over 10% of cab drivers, were convicted by the police for drunkenness, misbehaviour, or cruelty to the horses. So, 10%. So, uh, I don't think there was a lot of empathy there for the horses. Uh, the lowest grade of, of acne horse worked the night shift. So, after a few years, you find yourself as a horse doing the night shift. Because the condition of you couldn't be seen in the dark, because the streets weren't so well lit, and the carriages you were pulling were probably on the way out and very grimy. So you would do the, if you was, a, you know, the last sort of year of you work, you would work through the night as a carriage horse. The next sort of lowest grade was the Sunday working horse, when all these were, were having their day off. You would get horses out on a Sunday, you would probably come, pull, pull in carts during the week, and then they come out on a Sunday for their owners to earn a bit of extra cash. So those horses never actually had a day off. And the use of cabs peaked in 1888, there were about just over 7,000 handsome cabs working the streets of London, and 4,000 
cows' carriages. Uh, and the hackney horses lasted about three years um, before they were sold on, and we'll see in the next slide. This is a, a cab horse after a uh, cab to cart. Sold on for around nine pounds. It started off at thirty quid. Sold on for nine pounds, uh, and there will be a, a cart for tradespeople around the towns or cities. Some will just last months. Some you may get a couple of years out of them. But from arriving in Ireland, if they have five or six years, they'd be very lucky. So at the end of the day, they put signs to pull cars. And, uh, and if we look at this, well, he's got a good bum on him there, you know, not had a bum on him to pull, to pull a car. But we look at these four legs here, it's what we call over the knee. Uh, it's knees over the front of the, of the hoof, they're not a good side of the house. Um, very flat feet, bone tendon there, and swollen knees. Sorry, if I can just go back to that other, this horse. Um, Oh no, sorry, take this one. No, I'll go forward. No, no, yeah. So, so, so here he is, spending these days pulling a, pulling a car. And what happened to him after that? Well, two thirds of all horses would die in the shaft between the shafts in the in harness. They would die working. They would just go down in the ground, and then they'd be taken away. And this is a sign from an early photograph. Has gone down, and there's nothing people can do about that. Yeah, so two thirds of horses all died in harness. Aside from the cattle horses, there were what we call omnibuses, early buses, that were pulled by either two or three horses. Uh, and this was quite a load. About in Victorian times, about 10,000 horses. Nearly all mares would work the omnibus trade in London. Uh, they started to work at age four or five, and they would work about five years. They would last five years pulling these, these omnibuses. These could hold up to 26 people. On average, there's probably about 14 people on at any time. So you've got about uh, a ton of people, or just over a ton of people there. The carriage itself, probably a ton and a half, probably nearly three tons. These two or three horses are pulling, so they're either pulling at least a ton or over a ton. Uh, and these would work for many, many hours a day, uh, six days a week again, uh, doing a minimum of at least 12 miles a day on the rooms. So very, very tiring work. And there was big operations, big companies. And of the 10,000 horses, we get big operators. This, this is a, a stable in a holding area. Horses, 700 horses were, were held in that. This has since been knocked down in London. But 700 horses in any one area. So if you've got the wall housed together like that, this disease was prevalent. Um, the care, you know, they weren't going to any fields, as I stated earlier. They were either locked in there or out on the streets. Hell of a life, hell of a battle. Uh, and, and, and if you got like a, a cough going through, going through the stables, it would spread very, very rapidly. And horses would be working with bronchitis and pneumonia and all sorts of diseases. Very, very sad. Uh, uh, what else we got? Um, about 1,300 horses would die a year doing this out on the streets. Uh, and then there was this great idea to put these coaches on trams. We've got the horse drawn tram. Well, moving along a rail made it a lot easier for the horses to pull the coach. But what the operators thought was, well, what we can do here, because it's easier for the horses to pull along, we'll put a bigger coach on the back and make more, maximise what we can do from the pulling power of the horse and get more money for it. So these poor horses were actually pulling probably up to five tons when they and if you look at the gradients, the gradients are say, going up here, and I've drawn this in here to give you an idea of the, the gradient, the, the slope, that's a one in a hundred, so if you've got hundred yards or hundred metres, it would go up one metre in that period. So quite a low gradient. When these tram horses were pulling up there, that five tonne turns a ten tonne, double the weight. And 
And the 150 gradient, which was quite common, or you think of the arch, the arch of 140 at that time, that trebled the weight. So a hell of a weight for these horses to pull. And compared to omnibus horses, who had five years in harness, these had four, these lasted just four years. Some weaker horses would last 18 months. Just 18 months that they were done for. And also the tram line started to clog. You know, they're okay when they knew, but over time they got dirt and mud, grime in them. Uh, and and they became, the friction, you know, stopped the horse, stopped the, stopped the pulley even more. Interestingly, these horses would have about 500 stops and starts a day. And when you stop, it takes five times the power to start that again than it is on a normal, when, they, when they're tramping along normally. So a start can be like a mile just pulling along a straight line. So stopping and starting, a heck of a weight to pull. Uh, and then, as I said, these had about 500 stops and starts in a day. And it was a sudden stopping and starting that wore these horses and gave them a low expectation of life. And they weren't only tram stops, you could just stop a tram, just put your hand up and stop the tram. So people would do that. Uh, stop them anywhere along the line. So it's a very, very hard for them. Uh, and as I say, they lasted on average about four years in work. So still very, very young horses. And here I found a, a picture I thought was quite interesting. This, this looks like a, a European city, and we'll see the travel away there. And this poor horse, this is one horse balloon. He looks in a, in a very, very sorry state, or she, most likely a most likely in there. It's in a very, very small size. Sorry? Well, they, they were, um, if you didn't get on the horse, they were very, uh, I don't know if you know what that was, but it, yeah, if you get on a male horse, you calm them down. If you've got a stallion, a full horse, they're always looking for female horses, would fight each other. If you've got two horses in arms, and they were both full horses and not gelded, they would fight. One would want to dominate the other. And actually that would be on to a point. When you've got two horses in harness or three, one would always pull more than the other. You would never you would imagine they would pull equally, but they didn't. One horse would be a bit brighter and you'd realise his mate would pull a bit harder and he'd ease off. So one horse would wear out like a few. Um, but yeah, and so the, the, the female horses were, were less Dominant would were less likely to, to, to fight each other. No, you, the, the breeding stop was over in Ireland. Uh, you wouldn't want to bring it from one of these worn out horses because you had a breeding industry in Ireland that was supplying uh, a, a young market. To take one of these away and breed from them would be, would be very, very difficult. Um, because Ireland had the land and the grass and the, and the feed, it was easy for them. And Ireland today is, is a big so, overworked horses made by their trade. Uh, this poor lass, looking great, Nick. Again, as I was saying earlier on, about the knees are always the first thing to go. Uh, you can see probably a disease called lymphangitis in that, like uh, all small and. Uh, and bursitis in the knee as well, which is all the fluid leaking out into the knee. Bit ribby, uh, done a lot of work there, in great pain. 10% of the horses in the trade were cleared out each year. We got rid of 10% and a new load in. Uh, and those that ended up like this, if you couldn't treat them, you killed them. You didn't, if people didn't waste time with veterinary medicine, didn't they? So they would try and get the old boy better or the old girl better. No. Uh, and 26,000 horses at any one time in the Victorian uh, annually would be killed in the slaughterhouses, whole maps to death. Uh, Act of Parliament stated that any horse entering a slaughterhouse should not come out alive. And immediately the horse went through the slaughterhouse gates, they cut off the mane, so the value of the horse went straight out, so nobody could sneak the horse out and sell it. So her the mane was cut off, what we call hot. Not great name, but that's, that's the name of the horse. So you would know immediately that horse was for slaughter. 
You were allowed to keep them up to three days if you were very busy. You'd keep them up to three days in the slaughter yard, and then they had to be slaughtered no matter what, under the law. Uh, so for an average value of £30 when they started work, they were worth 30 shillings, or £1.50. So it devalued greatly. Uh, the bones were used for fertilizer, candle making, oil and lubrication. Some bones went for buttons. Uh, the meat for cat food, the innards, the tribe, for dog food, the fat and hooves for glue and laundry gluing. Uh, the manes, the hair on the neck and the tail, was used to um, stuff chairs and sofas, used for fishing line, uh, and added to plaster and wood to make uh, plaster on for house construction, building construction. Uh, and probably the most ironic thing of all is that uh, the leather of the horse will be used for carriage roofs, so they never escape the carriage even in death. In this talk, I've only got an hour, I'm running through it. About 40 minutes now. Um, these are areas I haven't covered because they're probably well documented and you probably know about these. Some of you have. We've got horses in mines that we know about. There's a horse coming down the mine, coming in the mine. We know about, probably know about stagecoaches in the 17th and 18th century, well documented on the toll roads, how you know, it was outlaws to get them. Know a bit about that. Because horses in war, it's pretty well documented since the anniversary of the First World War last year and War Horse and various books on uses of horses in war. <coughs> I find this quite upsetting this picture actually. It's, this is a French machine gun battery from the Second World War. Uh, and the way you stop movement of armaments is killed means of transport. So the enemy would kill the horses then you could move the gun. So they were sacrificed in the thousands, in their millions. So what about horse-drawn carriages today? Horse-drawn carriages with cars. Mm -hmm. Are they different today than what they were in the Victorian times? All got the, this operational London tourist on the bus. And I come from Scunthorpe, and I photographed this not so long ago, quite recently, this, this old car I was here, this is what we probably used to call the wagon bone car. Well, these two, you probably think those on the left look better than him or her. But now, this horse is actually better off than me, so I can say. I've got time to go to work. So, are they any different today to what they were in the past? Well, New York is a great example. It's a big tourist area, and these are on the streets all over New York. Uh, and they go down quite frequently, so it's easy to get all the information. Uh, what happens, a lot of this happens in Britain, uh, but it's not photographed much and it's not that well documented, but I can assure you it does go on in this country quite a lot. But we've got picture evidence here. So we see modern roads are hard and smooth glass, not great for the hooves of horses, and they go down regularly. Because this one, if we talk about the harnessing of horses earlier on, see this is a breast collar harness, not a great way of stabilising a horse, so they can easily slip and the carriage goes over. So the centre of gravity is great. If you had a full colour harness on, this may not have gone over. But the, 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 that, the, that, that breast colour harness is a cheaper method of harnessing a horse, and, but it isn't always that suitable. Have they not got studs in their shoes? No. If, if they're working on high sea, uh, on, on an icy surface, they may, they may have the stud on, on the shoe, um, or snow or muddy areas or whatever, it may be a stud on the back of the, on the, back of the horseshoe. Um, but I'm guessing that most would just have the plain flat shoe. So how are they housed? You know, they don't go, at the end of the day, they don't go to a, a green field and, and, and chew the grass. They go into these abandoned apartments and office blocks. And these are converted stables. The stairs are replaced by ramps. And we've got very cramped stabling in these office doors, you know, real fire hazards. You've got very flammable things there. With electric lighting, 
to go with straw, hay, wooden stable, very, very cramped. If this fire, you'd never get a man. You know, most of them would die. But it looks like not a good sign here. It looks like, I think that straw on the ground, not here, and the horse is eating his bedding, which is not a good sign. Um, so that's the sort of places the house in these empty apartment blocks. The horse is still dying in harness. Trying to get him up there, uh, or her up. We see that the lions is enough cut the leg, and the horse is dead. Mm. Well, the dead horse being cast. So you see these horse-drawn tourist carriages in these uh, all across Spain and, and all tourist areas around the world, all the big touristy cities. Um, probably what you don't see is this. This get out early in the morning or, or late on the shift or whatever. Again, we see the harnessing of this horse, chest collar harness, got a great harness and gone there. I think this horse actually got up again, as I remember. Uh, but what happened to her? I don't know. She won't be working again, that's for sure. So, in a way, what do we do with regards to this? Well, we've got a few campaigns over the years, primarily two very touristy areas, Oxford and Eastbourne. Uh, and this was. Uh, this, this horse and carriage was in, was in Eastbourne a couple of years ago and we got wind that we wanted to operate it. This guy's from the council, on the council, and he's smiling, saying this is going to be great for Eastbourne. There are tourist carriages running along the prom. Fabulous, great tourist attraction. They say we got wind of it. So we thought we'll go and talk to the Eastbourne and also to the Oxford councils uh, and explain to them what is really going on. There's no glamour behind this at all. Uh, we looked at the bylaws that in, they're, they're, they're in, or non-existent or were totally adequate because a lot of the bylaws date from Victorian times. So they're very, very crude laws for the protection and welfare of horses. Very, very crude and very outdated. No science behind them whatsoever. Uh, so we, we looked at the bylaws in detail, we criticised those, took those apart very, very easily. And we said that, we, that the council would need to pass new bylaws in order to be operational under the, the Animal Welfare Act of 2006, uh, which they wouldn't be able to do. Uh, and this is, for example, Eastbourne, Oxford, is, is exactly the same as this, but this is a, a montage of, of pictures that were presented to the council. I'll quickly put them all together here. We can see these foul drains in the road. The horse gets his hoof in now. He's going to come down on his knees, break a leg, or rip off a shoe. This is a big foul drain there. The horse comes off worse when he gets his toe into that. Um, we looked at the tight road areas for turning. Uh, we looked at the traffic in the roads. That's a you know a big tourist bus backing into a parking area. If you're in this behind that, you can't go back very easily. Very unlikely. Very very. Unlikely. Um, and all the traffic, constantly stopping and starting with the horses, wearing them out. So we recommended not to go ahead with this. And we got half the council in the room, spoke to the council leader, and afterwards he came up and he says, no way are we going to have this operating on our streets, which was great. One final point. I just want to say this is a, a joint effort, Animal Anglade. It takes a lot of people to put this sort of thing together. We've got fear. Stand up, fear. Come on. <laughs> this is a really nice We have worked tirelessly on, on the, all the horse campaigns. Um, Andrew Tyler, the director, Carol Kate, and, and all the crew behind the scenes, such as Ian and everybody else. So it's a team effort to get, to get these these victories that, uh, small victories, but uh, big victories for the horses. Just interestingly, we're going to start and stop the operation at this bus stop here and tap the business from there. It's on a slant, not a great place to start off from. Eastbourne is the sunniest place in the country. If you want to go on in England, go to East Eastbourne, because that's where you can get the most sun. It's also the warmest place, obviously, with the most sun. There was no water facilities there. 
No shelter or shade on a hot summer's day. And horses, unlike, unlike us, we can sweat and have a drink at any time we want, take a, a clothes off, a jacket off, whatever. Horses' thermoregulation is very, very poor. And they overheat very quickly, and they collapse and die very quickly. In racing, which I, I often talk about, a lot of horses drop dead because of heat exhaustion. So they may run the race, and they come out of the race, and they overheat, they can't cool down, and bam, they drop dead. And that could have been a problem. So, uh, this is, I showed this one earlier. This is operated, this is hired by Stanford's bookshop in London. Uh, a very, yeah, as you said, very, not in great need, of course. He's quite quickly, so he's using more energy than he is taking in, even though he's got the full colour. Not very full of on him. Less than one in than that. Also, I showed a few pictures back of putting the car on. And it looks like it's developed what they call cat pox here, which is a swollen heart joint in, in the rear legs. Uh, and, and again, pulling these around London. Might look pretty to people, but far from it. So we're going to work on this campaign next year. This is already operational, so it's slightly different. Could make it a bit more difficult for us, but I think we can put a damn good case and try and get it stopped. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to leave on a bit more of a positive note. Uh, this is a recent uh, work of art. These are, this is the biggest art sculptures in the world. These are 100 foot high, done by Andy Scott. Well, the kelp is up near Falcon in Scotland, just, uh, just past that river. Probably well worth having a look to see it. It's some art can be anything it wants to be to the person who's looking at it. I'd like to think this is a tribute to the, um, to the power and the sacrifices that horses have made so that we've got the standard of living that we've got to make. So, thank you.